Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast, the resource for transitional and experienced genealogists who want to create a successful business. I'm your host, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Here you'll learn from professionals all around the world who work in the field of genealogy. Are you ready to get started? Then let's get going. This podcast is sponsored in part by the Association of Professional Genealogists. You can find out more about them at www.apgen.org. Welcome to Episode 24 of the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Today we head back down under to Australia to chat with genealogist Helen Smith. Helen, welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Hi, Marianne. Thank you for the invitation. I'm honored to be here. Oh, it's wonderful to have you on the show. I'd love to have the Australians on. Let's get started by having you tell us about yourself and give us an overview of your genealogy business. I'm 49, single, born and living in Queensland, Australia. I started researching in 1986, age 22. Yes, there are young genealogists out there, even back then, to finally answer a question my mother had had about her grandfather, whom she had never known due to a family split. I had success in that research and became totally hooked and addicted and it has never abated. My father was English, so I've been researching in both countries ever since. Primarily, currently, I'm an educator and writer. I also do medical family history research and have run some workshops for health professionals about this subject. I don't do a lot of direct client research currently, although this is planned to change. I'm also working part-time helping conference organise with Unlock the Past Cruises. Their fourth cruise leaves on the 4th of February, with a fifth around the UK leaving in July this year. And plans are already underway through to 2017, with more being planned. So your mum's Australian, right? And your dad's English? Yeah, my mum was seventh generation Australian. Dad came out in 1949 as a nine-year-old. So before her family was in Australia, they came from England, though, if she's that many generations. England primarily with a little bit of Welsh and a little bit of Irish. Oh, good. I'm glad you got a little diversity in there. That's good. (laughs) Otherwise, it's too easy. All you have to do is learn English records. (laughs) Mm, Even English records can be interesting at times, depending upon where they are. Believe me, there is five million William Evanses in Wales. Oh, you know what? My ancestor, my immigrant ancestor from Wales is William Edwards. So we're in the same boat, Helen. Yep. So what was it specifically that uh, inspired you to move towards genealogy as a profession? I wanted to solve problems and share information, and it all basically just started from there. And... I was asked to give a presentation and I enjoyed it and then just kept giving more and more and here I am today. Was that first presentation related to the medical field or was it, you know, just strictly genealogy? It was actually strictly genealogy. Many people come to genealogy from another profession. We know you do something else because you're doing uh, genealogy part-time. So tell us about what you do for work full-time, and also if you did something different before your current career, give us a flavor of what you've been doing up till now. Okay. My family started a business way, way, way back in 1974 as an umbrella repairers and jewelry manufacturers, which is when I spent my five years outside of Queensland. So we worked in the family business at that point. Then I came back in 1980 and went to university to study to become a microbiology graduate. And I have worked since 1986 as a public health microbiologist and molecular epidemiologist. That's so interesting. You know, you're the first person that I've talked to for this show who has tied medicine to genealogy. Can you tell me a little bit about how your interest developed applying Um, the medical part to genealogy? Because I know there's this whole field of medical genealogy and looking at our ancestors and health and diseases and things like that. Can you, without being too technical, give us a sense of of what it is you do and how you interpret things for us in regards to this? Okay, being a public health microbiologist, you're investigating outbreaks. And I've had a strong interest in history, obviously, being involved in genealogy. So I was looking in the past at outbreaks in the past, 
then of course you do a lot of work with death certificates and then of course you realize that the medical profession is actually quite a young profession in what they actually know. So you look at early death certificates and the death certificates give the cause of death on what they saw. So they died of the blue pox or the black pox rather than what the underlying disease actually was. So I delved a lot into that. And then that led into looking at people's health histories and trying to determine for them what some of those early certificates and causes of death meant, particularly the ones that weren't talked about, women's troubles. You know, basically you can have a history of breast cancer or ovarian cancer, but it's hidden in women's troubles. So you would actually see that on death certificates where it says woman's troubles as the cause of death? I've seen it on a few death certificates. You also sometimes get a story down in the family that she died of woman's troubles. I think it's so fascinating that you get to do this for your work. And it's so applicable to genealogy and history because, you know, many epidemics and things like that, Uh, are things that we want to research. Like when you go to a cemetery and then you start to see that a lot of people died in the same time period. And and you're sort of the perfect person to really analyze that. Yeah, I have a lot of fun with that. And it it, it was so much of the pre-vaccination era. Unfortunately, you're talking 25% of young children dying before the age of two. Mm -hmm. 75% of young children in institutions like workhouses dying period. And then that becomes really, really scary. Looking at TB, people forget that TB was the major killer in the developed world till the 1950s and still is a major killer in the undeveloped world. So Helen, how did you prepare yourself to become a professional genealogist? I'm guessing that when you started on your path towards um, you know, genealogy, that you were focused more on genealogy and not necessarily the medical aspect of it. So what did you do from an educational point of view, to prepare yourself for the genealogy part and also for a business part? I'm an education junkie and a voracious reader. In my early research years, I was working full-time and attending uni part-time, which meant that libraries and archives just weren't open. For some unknown reason, they don't like opening at midnight or one in the morning. So, And that was when I had the free time to research, so I started collecting resources And I've never stopped collecting resources, which is why I have around 10,000 books in my home. Nowadays, the resources, a lot of them I collect, are actually online subscriptions. And that stood me in good stead. Um, I have also am studying the Professional Development Certificate through the National Institute of Genealogical Studies. From a business perspective, I grew up in a family business, so I had a lot of exposure to the paperwork and the business requirements previously through that. And, you know, today... Even in the last five, ten years, there's so many educational opportunities online with webinars and podcasts, including your own, of course, that, that it's, stuff's available for people to know and learn. Are there any webinars that are local to Australia? Because I know, you know, Legacy Family Tree does webinars every Wednesday, and Jeff usually, the host usually asks, you know, where people are from. And there's always Australians on. It's usually like 4.30 in the morning when these people are up watching the webinar. Are there any local webinars that are available so you don't have to get up at these unusual times to watch them? Society of Australian Genealogists do do a webinar program. Currently, they're the only ones. Unlock the Past has been planning and and is going to be doing a webinar program, although they may do that as Hangouts. I think in some ways Hangouts on air could be the way of the future for a lot of people to do things. And certainly Hangouts have been very good for interactions. We use Hangouts with the Guild of One Name Studies quite a bit for contact around the world. But there's not a lot of webinars produced in Australia. What skills did you bring to your business when you started it? And let's not talk about the medical stuff because the biology and the medical, we understand that you got that from your profession. But what other skills did you bring to your business you know, working with your family or whatever and how have they helped you? Persistence, an insatiable curiosity, problem solving, analyzing the evidence. That A lot of that was probably in my nature, which is why I went into to what I did anyway. I also had done a lot of presentations as a scientist, 
So that has brought, stood me in great stead doing them as myself now. And I've been reading doctors' handwriting for 27 years, so that's really, really helped. That's a really big advantage. <laughs> I swear they take a class in how to actually have the worst handwriting and that's how they graduate. Maybe they have to retake that class a few times. What skills did you lack when you started your business? You say you focus on writing and speaking. Did these come naturally to you or did you really have to work on those skills? I worked on them because I'm a bit of an introvert as such. And one of the big problems I find is for me is marketing myself. We're not ever really trained to sell yourself. It's like writing a job application where you know, you, you're supposed to sell yourself really, really well. And effectively, this is what a business is. You are selling yourself. But it's not something that people are really trained to do. And I'm still not 100% comfortable with really doing it. And so probably have missed some opportunities that I should have taken that I haven't. That's a very good point. It's, that's a hard part for many people, especially if they're not naturally gregarious. So what was the hardest part about starting a genealogy business and putting yourself out there? Time. Um, I was the financial support for my parents since the early 90s. Um, Dad passed on in 2003, and I seriously considered working out how to develop things then, but had about a cancer, so that put me six years back. And then the global financial crisis came, and you know that really wasn't the time to be going out full-time at all. If you had a job, you stuck with it. Mum unfortunately died in late 2012. So now the decision is, do I stay part-time and continue to develop slowly and then retire and go full-time? Do I go full-time in the near future? Perhaps that decision will be taken out of my hands because there is a certain amount of government downsizing still occurring. So perhaps the decision will be made for me. Interesting. Sometimes there are opportunities that open up when things are kind of put upon you. So uh, it can be good both ways. I've, I've been working on the principle that effectively I could lose my job at any time, which is one of the reasons I've been developing further over the last year, 18 months. Things have been fairly unsettled where I work. So we'll see. In, in a way, it's a very good thing that you, you're aware that there is that possibility because if, if you're a proactive person, you can really prepare yourself you know, without taking that final step of going full-time into genealogy, you can prepare yourself so when that time comes, you're ready. I mean, that's a great advantage over somebody who just gets laid off and they don't have uh, anything built up already. So, Yeah, and now that basically I'm only supporting myself, mm -hmm. um, I've got some more freedom to go down that route. When you're actually supporting other people, you have to be a bit more careful in what you do. Right, right. Share a story of an obstacle or a challenge that you encountered when you started your genealogy career and how you worked around it. And it can be anything. It could be um, a challenge that you, re that you encountered with your research or uh, a business aspect that you just didn't know about, anything. One of the things was getting myself known outside my local area. I live in Queensland and it was a case of to survive as what I do, I really needed to get known outside. And that was a case of networking and approaching people you don't know and selling yourself. Facebook's been very good for this. And being helpful on Facebook in other groups you're on does help you get known. And also Facebook's been very, very good for the opportunities to listen to other people and see what they do. And this is where I do have to thank Thomas McKenty at this point, particularly for his openness and willingness to share information about how he promoted himself and his business it's been extremely helpful to see how other people do do those things. And that's been one of the big things for me. I'm lucky in that my work means I do travel a fair amount. So because of that sort of encouragement, I've been able to organise a number of interstate presentations attached to a work trip. Obviously, I paid my own accommodation, et cetera, after I finished work. But it meant that I was already in that area so I could actually give a number of interstate and actually have given a number of presentations in New Zealand as a result of being over there for work. Well, I think you're doing a pretty good job. I don't know how many genealogists there are in Australia. I, I would imagine that there's a whole bunch and a whole bunch of professional genealogists, but I know of four off the top of my head, and you're one of them. So that's pretty good. 
Thank you. That that is actually means it's actually working. So. Oh yeah. I mean, online I, presence is helping. I see. I see your stuff on Facebook all the time. I mean, I if somebody said Helen Smith, I would definitely know who you were. And I've seen those pictures of you and Thomas McKenty, so I know you've met in person. <laughs> they were only the non-embarrassing pictures. You know, it it, it it's a different um, sort of person who will put themselves out there and interact internationally when it's harder to find something in common. We have technology and different aspects that we can, and blogging and things like that, that we can talk about, but not everybody's comfortable reaching out to people in another country and sharing ideas and things like that. Well, effectively, really, we're all very much the same. And this is one of the things, and maybe that's because my dad was English, so I've had a, had a lot of exposure there and um, have been very comfortable talking with people overseas because I've had those sorts of connections. And hey, people are people. So there's always something in common. Have you reached a moment in your business yet where you feel, you know, fairly confident about what you're doing, that everything has come together, even though you're doing it part time, you've been doing it for a while now. Have you reached that sense of, of confidence and when you go on the cruise to give the, the talks with Unlock Your Past and things like that, that you say, yes, this is great and I'm going and you're not quite as uh, nervous as you used to be? Has that time come for you? That time came a while ago. On the first cruise, I was quite nervous about what was actually going to happen and so on. So I had never done a cruise. The cruises are fantastic because you get totally looked after, but the conference is what is the important thing for me. And I'm very comfortable talking about topics I know. So actual talking doesn't make me nervous or distracted. So I'm very comfortable now in the presentations and comfortable in my own abilities and knowledge. So what services do you offer now? You say that you do the public speaking and and the writing. How did you decide what services you were going to offer while you were in this stage of your career? And have you given thought to what you're going to do when you become full-time? Do you think that your services will change at that point? I'm still evolving in the services I'm offering. And yes, going full-time, I will be doing a lot more client research. I've done some small amounts of client research now, but I will be developing that a lot further. And as the world's economic situation improves, I think there'll be a lot more potential there. I do a fair amount of Australian research and English research. So there's major areas there. And the medical area is a big area that's not well tapped. So that's another area to run into, particularly for general practitioners to be able to talk to them about how to take a genealogical health history and how to interpret some of those things. They know it can be useful, but a lot of their patients don't know much about it. So there's no point just the GP just asking for a health history of the patient and the patient's family because the patient doesn't know how to do it. So you need to train the doctor or at least a senior nurse in the doctor's practice in how to go about asking the right questions and what sort of information they need to be able to draw from the patient and the patient's records. I think this medical aspect of what you do is is probably your most unique skill and your most unique service. I, I would almost like to say you're the only one that I know of that does something like this. However, I think in the United States, if people do something like that, they're probably a little bit more focused on the DNA side than the angle that you're coming from. But I see this as an area where you could really become extraordinarily well-known and really benefit many people, both professional people and genealogists, you know, as you mentioned, doctors, by developing this whole connection. Are you familiar with Judy Russell? She's American. She, Definitely. She's called the, the... I was privileged to hear her when I came across to Roots Tech last year and I went to the APG Professional Management Conference just before Roots Tech and was very privileged to hear her speak. Yeah, she She's the legal genealogist. That's her blog. And she's incredibly popular because she fills a need that we all have in teaching us how to interpret and understand historical law. And and we just so love her for that. And I think that there's potentially a place like that for you in regards to medicine and your understanding of epidemics and uh, things like that. I hope you'll do some good business planning and brainstorming in that area because I think there's so much you could do with that. It's an area I've been looking at developing further. I'm three quarters way through writing a small publication on it 
and I will be talking about it on this on the fourth cruise because it, people are becoming interested in trying to work it from that perspective. Yeah, people are starting to talk about uh, medical genealogy and you know the history of diseases and such in families. Maybe I'm just not tapped into that. Maybe maybe there's a lot of discussions going on and I'm not tapped into that. But I, I think there's a lot more. Uh, room for that to grow. What's been the most challenging aspect of being a genealogy professional from a business point of view? Time and marketing. Um, I have been working on developing a website, but it's not as perfect as I want it yet, so I haven't put it up. At some stage, I'm going to have to slap myself on the wrist and actually say, put it up now and then tweak it later. So that's what I've been working on behind the scenes. Primarily, my blog is my big face apart from being on social media. Your blog is a way that you interface with a lot of genealogists, both in Australia and America? That's correct, yes. Because I noticed, I'm going to point you out publicly here, you don't have your blog listed on your APG profile. I'm actually in the process of finishing writing my APG profile. All right, good. Which All is right. sitting here actually waiting to be sent up to actually be emailed to the APG site. So so we are, you know, this is a, a professional and, and, and more business oriented podcast. So we do want to make sure that everybody's putting their best foot forward. So that while you're waiting to get your website done, you could just have your blog there, which would be great. How do you balance your time between paid work and um, volunteer work? That's a challenge and it's always going to be a challenge. I'm learning to say no on occasions. Currently, I'm the president of the Southern Suburbs Branch of Genealogical Society of Queensland and also the Queensland Regional Rep for the Guild of One Name Studies. And I also pay forward volunteering with a number of indexing projects with Family Search, the Guild and Trove, which is our Australian newspaper collection, which is digitised online and free but of course is OCR'd and needs correction. So I tend to do a number of those. The advantage with the indexing particularly, it's things I can do at odd times. So if I'm taking a half hour to watch TV, I can index as well. I'm always going to be doing volunteer work because I'm a firm believer in paying it forward, but I've had to say no on a number of occasions. If it's a project that will help me perhaps get better known, I'm more inclined in the future to be saying perhaps yes to some of those. But unfortunately, time is a major problem for me. So I have to be very careful in what I say yes to now. Yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong about being strategic about your volunteer time. And and I would say that people should even put their volunteering into their business plan. Part of, uh, yes, I recognize that volunteering is important and this is something that I want to do. And I'm going to incorporate it into my overall business plan uh, because it's an aspect of my business. So it's good. It sounds like you're on the right track with that. So Helen, what's the uh, the most fun project that you've ever worked on that you can share with us? I'd have to say at the moment, it's working behind the scenes with the Unlock the Parts cruise team, getting a conference up and going and the working behind it and getting the balance of speakers right and topics right and all of the organising that goes with it, particularly the forward planning. As I said, Unlock the Past have actually got cruises planned through to 2017. So you've got all these balls being juggled in the air and all of these speakers that you're talking with and getting information from about their topics and working out how to balance a cruise and balance the conference so it's best for the participants so they get an overarching greatness because on a cruise you're being catered for for every luxury you actually want. But you're also involved with 200 people who are as addicted and fanatical about the subject as you. So you want to make it a great experience for them. So, And you also get to being a terrorist. So it's been really great fun working behind the scenes. Plus I've got the added advantage I also put my speaker's hat on, and I'm a speaker on the cruise as well. Now, can you explain to me a little bit more about Unlock the Past? I know that it's uh, a cruise and that genealogy speakers in Australia go on the cruise and things like that. Is it just a conference? Is it a company that does research? What exactly is Unlock the Past? Unlock the Past is a sister company to Google Genealogy who has been the premier genealogy supplier of books and resources, CDs, since oh, the early 70s. They've been around for many, many years. They're based in Adelaide. A number of years ago, Alan Phillips, who's the head of Unlock the Past and also Google Genealogy, saw there was a need to actually get information out to people 
So had done some road shows around the country where he was bringing some international speakers out to actually tour the country and give people opportunities because that had been a bit of a problem in Australia. And then from there came up with the concept of doing a cruise, which was jumped upon with open arms. Australia is a very new country when cruising is concerned. We've never really had a lot to do with cruising. So about three, four years ago now, we did the first one. And at that stage, I wasn't involved. I just went on as a speaker and was, became totally hooked with the concept and just wanted to get involved. And so Alan Phillips, is the CEO, has been doing a great job with all of that. He's also done a lot with Australian genealogy, has the Unlock the Past website where family history societies all around Australia can put up their events so that if you're someone new to genealogy, you can just log onto that website, type in your local area and see what's happening in your area because we hadn't really had a lot of cohesion on that. And so this is what, what they've been involved in. And as I say, um, I've spent more money than I care to mention with Google Genealogy over the years I've bought a lot of those resources I mentioned earlier from them, and I still am buying. They've kept things. Alona Tester, who you may know with the Loan Tester blog, does a lot of buying for them of new resources. Does the cruise go to the same locations every time, or does it vary every year? It varies. We did the first cruise, we went across to Vanuatu. The second cruise was New Zealand. Third cruise was Vanuatu and Fiji. Fourth cruise is actually doing the southern capitals. Fifth cruise is going to be around the United Kingdom, where you actually stop off in a few places around the United Kingdom and also you're going to Dublin for a day, so you've got an opportunity to do a little bit of research and touristing and having the conference on board. Then there's also looking at two Baltic cruises where you actually get to visit a number of uh, countries like Estonia, Finland... Norway, um, Russia, that's going to be fantastic cruises. There's a planned cruise for New Zealand again. There's a cruise that's leaving, just going to do a a short three-dayer for those people who aren't quite sure about this cruising business, and then they're going to go to Norfolk Island. And in Australia, convicts, as you probably are aware, settled the the early parts of Australia. We got a lot of um, perhaps slightly unwilling emigrants from England, once America decided you didn't want them anymore. And so a number of Australians have convict heritage. So they're going to be a short four-day cruise, which is a themed convict cruise. And then after that, they're going to do a tour of Norfolk Island, which was a secondary prison where some of the people who weren't as good as they should have been got sent. Then there's going to be a river cruise, which actually is doing a European river cruise. And there's talk of an Alaskan cruise, We're also going to be doing a cruise from Perth because next year is the 100th anniversary of Gallipoli, the Anzac landings, and the ships left from Albany in Western Australia. So there's going to be a short cruise out of Perth celebrating, well, you can't really say celebrating, commemorating the people leaving from there to go across to Gallipoli. Wow. So you... Your uh, the cruises are going to a lot of different locations. It sounds wonderful. Sounds great. There's lots of there's lots of options. There's also a possibility, which I think is going to be quite interesting, as a migrational cruise from England to the U.S. Mm-hmm. So transatlantic cruise, and potentially a cruise from England to Australia, which I would kind of love to do because my dad came out that way. Mm-hmm. Let's take a quick break to hear a message from the Association of Professional Genealogists. Hi, I'm Kathy Damaris, the Vice President of the Association of Professional Genealogists. The very first step I made towards my career as a genealogy professional was to join APG. At that time, the idea of researching for clients was just the spark of an idea in my mind. My APG membership brought me into contact with the best minds in the field and helped me learn about the array of educational opportunities available and the steps I needed to take to reach my goal. My first clients found me through the APG membership directory, and many of my clients still find me there. After a lot of education and hard work, I now have a full-time career as a professional genealogist. My membership in APG is one of my most valuable business assets. If you are thinking about a career in genealogy, I hope you'll join us too. 
please visit us on the web at apgen.org, A-P-G-E-N.org. All right, Helen, it's time for us to move to the lightning round. This is where I am going to bombard you with rapid fire questions, and you're going to come back with brilliant answers to help all the genealogists out there listening who are listening. Are you ready? Okay. All right. <laughs> what was the one thing you were most afraid of in starting your business? Selling myself to other people. What is the best advice you've ever received? Go for it. What is one specific action listeners can take in the next 24 hours to help them transition into a genealogy career? Educate themselves about professional genealogy by buying and reading the book Professional Genealogy, edited by Elizabeth Shawn Mills. And I do mean reading it. You need to study it chapter by chapter. And if they have trouble reading it on their own, they can join the ProGen study groups. And yep, do there's it been as quite a, a lot of them. I yep. think it's the 18th groups going through at the moment. I don't know, but they, they keep going, so people can continue to sign up. So, uh, Do you have a productivity tool like a Dropbox that you love and you can share with the audience? Dropbox, of course, which I'd used for work originally when I was doing collaborations with unis overseas. Skype is something that is people don't seem to use as much as they should. It's a fantastic way of collaborating with people all around the world as long as you get your time frames right. Ringing people in the middle of the night doesn't always get people happy. And I've been playing with Dragon Dictate, which shows a lot of potential. And tell, tell our audience what uh, Dragon Dictate does. Basically, drag and dictate means you can speak and it types for you. And it's got a pretty decent um, accuracy rate. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can punctuate as well, where you can go back in later and repunctuate. But it's a very, very good way of being able to get a whole heap of information down fairly quickly. And I've been playing with it for doing transcriptions, and it's coming along quite well. I had originally played with it a fair number of years ago, and at that stage it was a bit clunky but it's really done well. The, actually, it's interesting. The doctors in the morgue actually use a particular version of Dragon Dictate while they're actually recording their information for their autopsies. Hmm. That's interesting. I didn't know that. That's fascinating. I will have links to all of these productivity tools in the show notes for Helen's episode. So you can go to the genealogy professional.com and you can find the stuff there. If you can recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be? Well... I'm a health and medical style person, so and I'm so very strongly interested in history. So Health and Disease in Australia, a History by Jay Cumston gives a good indication of some of the historical history events that have been really prevalent in Australia. People have to remember that epidemics occurred and that health that we enjoy today is really only a very recent occurrence. That sounds like a great book. Okay, hypothetical scenario for you. I am going to have you not just move across the country, but move all the way to England because I want you to be out of your element. You don't know anyone there, and you're not familiar with the research in the records, where at least we can pretend you're not familiar <laughs> in that location. What are you going to do in the first month to hit the ground running and start a new genealogy business in a completely new location? Okay, I'm a member of APG. So I will tell the APG and update my profile. That's where I'm going. I'm a member of the Genealogical Speakers Guild, so I'll make sure they know as well. I will broadcast it widely through social media networks, and I will contact the local family history societies in the area I am. I'm already a member of the Guild of One Name Study, so I'll promote it through that area. And I'm a member of the Society of Genealogists in England, so I'll promote them through there. Then it's a case, once you're actually on the ground... Slight problem is I need a 10 ton truck to actually take all my reference library with me. So, a shipping container is going to be that's going to have to arrive fairly soon after I arrive, but it wouldn't worry me going there. Wow, it sounds like you could get yourself up and running pretty quickly. I think so. If you yeah. told me I was going to France or Germany, yeah, that could have been slightly should, more of a I problem. Have, I should have picked some place harder. <laughs> But that's okay. You gave a great answer anyway, so that's good. Give our audience one parting piece of advice and then tell us how we can get in contact with you. Education is never wasted. Invest in yourself. Genealogy, whether you're doing it professionally or any other way, it's a lifelong learning experience. So never stop educating yourself. I can be contacted by email, hbsresearch at bigpond.com. 
and I can be also contacted via my blog from Helen D. Smith's keyboard, and I can also be contacted via the Unlock the Past website. So what is the exact URL for your blog? That I'm going to have to tell you because I didn't type it in. I'm going to have to tell oh, you. Oh, no, that that's fine. Uh, I'll just get that later for the show notes. So no problem. Helen Smith, thank you so much for coming on the Genealogy Professional Podcast today. Thank you, Marion. It's been a pleasure. Well, Helen Smith gave us loads of information to think about. Whether you're from Australia or not, she talked about issues that impact all genealogists. For instance, medical research. That's a topic that is of particular interest to Helen, but it's a topic that really reverberates with everybody uh, because of the importance of medical history. And combining that with genealogy uh, is just a really interesting and neat topic that hopefully we'll all dive into a bit more in the future. Another thing that Helen talked about is, you know, when's the right time to go full-time? When's the right time to retire from your full-time job and go into genealogy full-time? She's currently a part-time professional genealogist. So it's important to consider how to make that happen and can you control the steps so that it's a smooth transition. She also talked about not liking the concept of selling herself, that she's had to develop this and become comfortable with this. We heard some really great stuff about cruises, and that is is such a fun concept when it comes to genealogy. And she also touched on the Australian convict heritage. Lots of great nuggets from Helen Smith. Each week, I do give you an action item, and I, of course, want to give an action item this week as well. This week, I think we'll focus in on what Helen was saying about not liking to sell herself, having to learn the process of gaining visibility, gaining a reputation, building an audience within the community. And one of the people that she had mentioned that she learned from was Thomas McKenty. So what I would like you to do for this week is to study a public figure and learn about where are they online. What do they do to make themselves known? Are they on a website? I hope so. Do they have a blog? Do they actively use social media? Are they public speakers? Are they active writers? Pick a person and try to determine all the different locations where that person is online. Here are just a few people that are possibilities for you to focus in on. Thomas McKenty, of course, which I've already mentioned. He will be a guest on the Genealogy Professional Podcast coming up in a couple weeks. Judy Russell, the legal genealogist, she's another good person to learn from and to understand how she has built her visibility within the community. Another super person to learn from is Lisa Louise Cook. And if we step outside the United States, uh, a really great person who's very active all over the place is Chris Patton, uh, who is based in Scotland. Check out one of these people or somebody else if you prefer and do a little analysis of where they are online and offline in publications, things like that, and how they build their audience and how they make themselves known within the genealogical community. Until next week, so long.